Welcome to our presentation of the paper Comparison of Algorithms for Simple Stochastic Games. This is joint work with my supervisor Jan Kutinski and two very good master students, Emanuel Ramniantu and Alexander Slavinsky. To allow you to take advantage of the fact that this is pre-recorded, here is the setting and main result of the paper in one slide with timestamps of each part. This allows you to jump to those details that you are interested in. First, we will introduce the model of simple stochastic games and give some intuition on how solving them works. Then we introduce all the algorithms, value iteration, strategy iteration and quadratic programming and theoretically compare them. Then, after talking about some optimizations we added, we also practically compare them. The outcome of the comparisons is that there is no clear winner but that every method has its advantages and disadvantages. So why should you care? You all know these kinds of pictures. Cyber physical systems and safety critical software are everywhere and we need to ensure that they are doing what they should. Thus, model checking stochastic games is practically relevant. Why should you choose a stochastic game to model your system? Well, they include control, adversary and probabilities, thus they are well suited for reactive systems, but they can also serve as an abstraction of large Markov decision processes, or you can use the adversary to model unknown probabilities and get a judgment on the worst case. Aside from the practical relevance, stochastic games are also fundamental and very interesting theoretically. Reachability is the most basic objective and several other objectives depend on solving reachability as well, for example, reaching the winning part of a parity game. Also, parity mean payoff or discounted payoff games all can be reduced to reachability games. Using turn-based games is also the most basic way of handling two players, providing the basis for more complicated models such as concurrent or bidding games. Stochastic games with a reachability objective are not called simple stochastic games without reason. They have the theoretical properties of being zero-sum games and they are determined. This makes arguing about optimal strategies and values very nice, as we do not have to analyze equilibria or trade-off and as it does not matter which player fixes their strategy first. But most importantly for this talk, Simple stochastic games pose one of the most natural decision problems that is in the complexity class NP intersect CoNP, where many people believe that this class might be equal to P. If someone found a polynomial algorithm for solving simple stochastic games, it would prove this highly relevant conjecture of complexity theory. So now that you are hopefully all hyped about solving simple stochastic games, let's try to understand the problem. This is a simple stochastic game. It includes a target state and we want to reach this target state. It includes stochasticity, so edges with probabilities, and it includes the states of the player maximizer and of the player minimizer. The objective of maximizer is to reach the happy state and the objective of minimizer is to prevent maximizer from doing so. Before we look at the algorithms, let's get some kind of intuition for how solving stochastic games works and for the kind of problems we will have to face. So, if we are in a target state, obviously the probability to be in a target is 1. This probability to reach a target is called value and denoted by a V on the slides. Dually to a target, there are sync states. A sync is a state with no path to reach a target and it has value 0. To keep things simple, Let's first consider only a single maximizer state that can choose between a target and a sink. Since maximizer wants to reach the target, the preferred action here is going up and the value of the state is 1. Dually, a minimizer state chooses the action yielding the minimum value, in this example 0. Now for the more complicated things, probabilities. Let's say that the successor of this action is chosen uniformly at random. So with one half probability reach a target, and with one half we come to the sink and are stuck. So the probability to reach the target from this state t here is one half. More generally speaking, for actions with multiple successors that are all reached with some probabilities, the value is defined according to the so-called Bellman equations. This means we sum the value of every successor 
multiplied with the probability to reach it from the state. In this example, it was 1 half times 1 plus 1 half times 0. If we have a probabilistic cycle, so now with one third we go to the target, with one third we go to the sink, and with one third we loop, things are a little more difficult. But intuitively, every time we loop, again we have an equal chance of reaching the target or the sink. So again, the value is 0 0.5. More generally speaking, we redistribute the looping probability on the successors outside of the loop. And this is then the only fixed point of the Bellman equation that I showed earlier. Now for the final complication, sure cycles, better known as end components. An end component is a part of the game where it could stay forever. In this game, state T could go left and cycle infinitely often with state S. So S and T form an end component. Since T can still go right, T can reach the target with probability one half. If T chooses to go right, then S also reaches the target with one half probability and thus the value of s is also one half. Note that if we are at state t and we only look at the values of our actions, going left and right seem equally promising as both of them yield one half. But only going right actually gives us the chance to reach the target. We will come back to this problem several times in the rest of the talk. The picture you are now looking at is the running example for the talk. The v will always denote the true value of a state. There might be other estimates that some algorithm computes at some point, but you can always refer to this to see where our computation should arrive. So, let's talk about algorithms. The first of the three we look at is value iteration. For value iteration, vi in short, we compute a sequence of estimates for every state. To track the computation, we use this kind of table. For every iteration and for every state, we save a lower estimate of its value. We can initiate all the lower estimates to zero. This is definitely correct, as that is a lower bound on any probability. The only exception is the target state, where we can even immediately initialize to one. Note that the estimates for target and sync will never change, so we can just fill out this side of the table. In every step, we perform a so-called Bellman update for a state. This does two things. It first computes the estimate of every action according to the current estimates of the states and then chooses the best action. The action A in state S leads to a state with current estimate 0. As this is the only action, the estimate of S stays at 0. For T, there are two available actions, so we compute the estimate for both of them. Action B goes to S, a state with lower bound 0, so the lower bound of B is also 0. Action C reaches the target with probability one third. The loop leads back to a state with current estimate zero and the other one third leads to a sink, so the estimate of C is one third. As T is a maximizer state, it chooses the action with higher estimate, goes right and gets a new estimate of one third. In the next step, the estimate of T is now one third instead of zero. So the new estimate of C is one third for the target plus one third times one third for the self loop. So we get four over nine. For S in the second iteration, we just copy the previous estimate of state T as S can only use action A to go to T. We can see that the estimate of T is currently less than 0 0.5, the true value, but it converges to 0 0.5 in the limit as the estimate becomes more and more precise. However, it only happens in the limit, and we do not know when to stop if we only use the lower estimate. So, additionally, we introduce an upper estimate that starts as 1 in all states and then decreases towards the true value. Here in the table, I removed the estimate of target and sync, as anyways they are always clear, and I added the upper estimate u for states s and t. If we look at state t, then using b and going left promises an estimate of 1. Going right with action c has a probability of 1 third to reach the sink, so it only promises a value of 2 thirds. So the maximizer state t will choose to go left to s, keeping an upper estimate of 1. So t depends on the estimate of s, but s also depends on the estimate of t. So these two states depend on each other and the naive upper value iteration does not converge as the estimates always stay at 1. 
The problem is the end component, the short cycle that we mentioned before. A solution was proposed recently. We find these problematic end components and force them to use the value of an exit, so they must not depend on each other. In this case, the exit is action C. If we force the upper bound to use this exit, we get this table. So now we can squeeze the true value of 0 0.5 between the converging upper and lower bound, and at any time we know the current precision of our estimates. If we are after the exact solution, we can consider strategy iteration or quadratic programming. Strategy iteration is in spirit similar, but this time we don't get a sequence of values, but a sequence of strategies. A strategy of a player tells us for every state which action the player wants to choose. Note that we do not need memory or randomization for the reachability objective, so this most simple type of memoryless pure strategies suffice. Okay, let's start with some random strategy of maximizer, so for every state we need to know what maximizer plays. In this case, let's say maximizer plays B in state T. Now that we fix the strategy, there is only one player left, so instead of a game, now we have a mark of decision process, a so-called MDP. These are simpler, and we can compute the values of all the states. Right now, let's just use MDP solving as a black box. We'll shine some light on that later. Solving the MDP computes these estimates of L equals zero in both these states. Now that we know what happens if we as Maximizer commit to this strategy, let's see if our initial choice was bad. We see that action B has a value of zero, while action C has a value of 0 0.3. Since the example is very small, this looks quite similar to value iteration, but note that these two are very different things. Value iteration does only local updates, while strategy iteration fixes a maximizer strategy and then computes the global optimum for the minimizer, and only then does it do one step of local improvement for the maximizer. In this example, maximizer realizes that the initial strategy was bad and chooses to switch to action C, since 0 0.3 is higher than 0. Now we have a strategy that is strictly better than before. If we fix action C and evaluate the Markov decision process, we get the correct estimates immediately. In general, we repeat this process of fix a strategy, solve the minimizer's MDP, switch the maximizer's choices locally, and then we converge to the optimal strategy. So now that we have seen value iteration, a sequence of estimates from above and below, as well as strategy iteration, a sequence of improving strategies, let's look at the final algorithm, quadratic programming. Quadratic programming was not looked at since the paper that introduced it, and we have to update it a bit to make it work on general games. But first let's start with the ideas of the previous work. The idea is to encode the game in a system of constraints as you see on the slide. We have that values of maximizer states have to be larger or equal than all their actions, values of minimizer states have to be smaller or equal than all their actions, and we fix the values of targets and sinks. Then, under these constraints, we minimize this objective function. Let's look at it piece by piece. We minimize a sum over all states. So for every state, we want the summand, this here, to be as small as possible. The summand is a product of two terms that are very similar. We take the value of the state and subtract the value of one of its actions. So if the value of a state is equal to the value of one of its actions, this factor becomes zero, and then the whole product becomes zero, and then the whole sum becomes zero. For every state, we can fix the value of the state to be the value of one of its actions, and then all summons are zero, and we get the global optimum of the objective function, namely zero. Now, there are several problems with this, and here we start the part where our contribution begins. Note that this objective function assumes that every state only has exactly two actions. This is necessary, because otherwise the program would not be quadratic. It is possible, because there exists a construction to transfer a game with too many actions into one where every state has just two actions, and the new game is only polynomially larger. Still, if we want to avoid this blow-up, we can replace the objective function with this product that takes into account all the actions of a state. For every action A, we now have a term v of s minus v of sa. 
Note that this makes the program higher order, not quadratic anymore. There is some technicality involved in this change and there are two further similar requirements that we had to lift, but I do not want to go into these details. The key point here is we can encode the game in these constraints and then optimize this function in order to find the values. However, there is one more requirement of the original QP algorithm that we absolutely have to lift. The game must not contain end component. So these subgraphs or this kind of short cyclic behavior under certain strategies. Otherwise, it can converge to a local optimum that is not the global optimum. And it can believe that the values of all states in here are too high, similar to what you saw in value iteration. The original way to deal with this is to add a small leaking probability epsilon, ensuring that the game terminates. This probability has to be chosen so small that it does not affect the value of the game significantly, and then we can round back to the original value. However, this epsilon must be really, really small. Even with a very rough over approximation, we calculated that in a game with 27 states, the epsilon becomes smaller than standard double machine precision. So this approach is absolutely impractical. Our suggestion of how to replace it is the following. We add new constraints for every end component. Now, this might look scary at first, but it's very straightforward. Basically, we are looking for the best strategies in the end component that optimize the value of exiting the end component. This is very similar to the idea in value iteration, that all states have to depend on an exiting action. More concretely, for a state t, we look at every exit and multiply the probability to reach this exit from t with the value of the exit. And then we iterate over all strategy pairs to find the optimal strategies of both players. Sadly, the number of strategies is exponential, so we add exponentially many constraints for every end component. Still, as we will see later, this is more practical than the previous idea of the epsilon transitions. But before we come to the practical comparison, let's first recap what you just saw and argue about the theoretical properties of all the algorithms. We have seen value iteration, which applies the Bellman equations to approximate the values and squeezes them between an under and over approximation. We have seen strategy iteration, which repeatedly fixes a maximizer strategy solves the MDP, the one-player game of the minimizer, and then updates the strategy of maximizer. And we have seen quadratic programming, which encodes the game in a system of constraints and then optimizes an objective function, which ensures that the value variable of every state must be set to the value of an available action. Complexity-wise, we know that value iteration is x time complete, so we definitely need exponentially many steps to compute the precise value. However, Value iteration also is an anytime algorithm, so it can stop early when a required precision epsilon is reached without spending all the time to compute a precise solution. For strategy iteration and quadratic programming, we know that they are in exp time, but we have no lower bound. Both algorithms have the potential of yielding a polynomial algorithm. For strategy iteration, there was quite some work in this direction, which resulted in some sub-exponential and randomized algorithm but none of these are proven to work in polynomial time. For quadratic programming, we are not aware of any work applying it to stochastic games beyond the paper that introduced it, but we know that solving convex quadratic programs is in P. So if we were able to encode the stochastic game in a convex quadratic program of polynomial size, we would have a polynomial algorithm. However, our current approach can add exponentially many constraints. So much for the theory side. For the practical comparison, let me first quickly sketch the optimizations we applied to the algorithms. I already told you about the higher order objective function for quadratic programming and the new treatment of end components there. This allows us to work on the original game and omit the transformations that blow up the game or that introduce probabilities that are too small to handle. For strategy iteration, one thing to note is that after fixing a strategy, we can solve the Markov decision process in different ways for example using value iteration or linear programming. Changing the solver for the MDP affects the runtime of the algorithm. Note that in particular we do not require a precise solution of the MDP, 
but we only need to know the relative ordering of the actions, so even an approximate solution of value iteration can be enough. For value iteration, we also included a learning-based variant that was introduced in previous work in the comparison. We also added two more optimizations that apply to all algorithms. Firstly, we extended the idea of topological value iteration that existed for value iteration in MDPs to all algorithms and to stochastic games. This optimization suggests to first decompose the game into a directed acyclic graph of strongly connected components. Then every component depends only on the ones after it. So proceeding back to front, we solve the game component by component, and since the components are smaller, this is faster. Finally, we have the optimization warm start. This means giving prior knowledge to the algorithm. For VI and QP, this can be values we already know or that we can easily compute by graph analysis. For SI, this means choosing an initial strategy not at random, but trying to guess something close to the optimal. For VI, in our implementation, we did not develop new pre-computations beyond those that already existed, but for SI and QP, we added an improvement. We first performed a few iterations of VI to guess a good initial strategy for SI, respectively a good starting vector for QP. So now we have the three algorithms and their optimizations. I do not want to go into the details of which combination of which versions of all the optimizations was best. I only want to say that all of them can be advantageous, and for more details you can have a look at the paper. In this table, we show the best version of every class of algorithm and a small subset of the case studies we considered. There are lots more in our paper. At this point, let me quickly advertise the GitHub where we made the code and all the benchmarks available. The models are a collection of all simple stochastic games we found or developed over the past few years, and I'd be happy if this collection made your life easier when you're looking for benchmarks. Also, I'm always glad to add to the collection if you know any models that I didn't include. All right, so let's look at the table. For each combination of algorithm and case study, we report the time that a fully optimized version of the algorithm took. Note that we also report the times of a hop, a higher order program, not a quadratic one. There are two key points I want to make here. Firstly, hop is not as bad as expected. There are models where the higher order program is about as good as the other two algorithms. This includes CDMSN MEC and MULMEC E3, which both are models that include several MECs. MULMEC actually has a thousand MECs, and here hop even is faster than VI. So for small mechs, three states in this case, our treatment of end components works. The previous version of QP with the epsilon transitions has no chance of solving this. Still, on some other models, hop is a lot worse. For example, on AV or on the model with a single big end component, big mech. A thousand state end component is completely infeasible for hop. The X denotes a timeout of 15 minutes, but even with more time, hop is lost here. But overall, we were surprised that on many case studies, a variant of quadratic programming performed well, even though, to the best of our knowledge, no one has practically considered the method in the past 20 years, and it is considered common knowledge that it is slower than the others. The second point I want to make is that VI and SI perform quite similarly, and there is no clear winner. They often are equally fast, and both have models where they are a lot faster than the other. So, in conclusion, what should you take away from this talk? You have seen the three classes of algorithms for simple stochastic games with some optimizations. These optimizations might also apply in other settings or to other algorithms. Generally, looking at other objectives about reachability is an interesting next step, as those usually depend on or reduce to reachability. We theoretically compared the algorithms, and we saw that using the approach of SI and QP might still result in a polynomial algorithm. Since QP has not been looked at, there might be potential for new ideas in that direction. Practically, you saw that the extension of QP, HOP, is not too bad, and that both VI and SI perform very similarly. In this direction, there are two things I want to mention. Firstly, our experiments showed that using different solvers for QP or HOP has a huge impact on the runtime. So if there was an advance in the area of optimization problems or a new solver, this would immediately carry over and potentially make HOP the best method. Generally, it makes sense to practically compare algorithms and implementations, 
There already exist things like the QCOM friendly competition where different tools are compared with respect to their considered models and performance. However, currently there is no competition for games. If we had such a competition or the existing ones were extended, this might motivate people to provide better implementations or to explore new algorithmic directions. I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to taking any questions you have, be it via mail or in the Q&A session of Gandalf. Goodbye.